What's going on guys, Doomwink here, and welcome to another video on the channel. If you don't know already, the Outlaws of Thunder Junction full spoiler has been revealed. Normally I've been doing like honorable mentions plus some top 10, and there is some interesting cards in the set. I didn't exactly know how to order them, so I kind of just picked 15 cards at random that I think that are very good, that I like quite a bit. And uh, there's no particular order here. We're going to let you guys decide. What, do, what is your favorite card in the set? What are you most excited to brew with? Please be sure to let me know in that comment section down below. And uh, without further ado, let's get started with the first card here, which we have Colossal Rattleworm. This is two green green for a 6-5 that has flash as long as you control a desert. Uh, it's a 6-5 trample, and you could pay two mana to exile it from your graveyard, search your library for a desert card, put that onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So there's a couple of cool things going on here. First and foremost, it is if you have a desert, it's just a four mana 6-5 flash. Those stats, I think, are pretty good. Maybe good enough for standard, potentially not quite good enough for pioneer or for modern. So that's just the baseline. If you have a desert, 6-5 flash, 4 mana, I think those are good enough stats. But what's really cool is you can actually kind of synergize a little bit with this, where if you mill it over, say, perhaps with a surveil land, which I know a lot of people like surveil lands, not quite as popular in standard, so keep that in mind. But there's also other self-mill angles where you have stuff like... Uh, Insidious Roots is a great example of that, where the Insidious Roots deck has a lot of self-mill, it wants to put creatures in the graveyard, and this also, on top of all of that, if you can mill it over, also triggers Insidious Roots, because it's considered exiling a creature from the graveyard. So, a lot of cool stuff to like here, and, you know, I mean, this is maybe, you know, Magical Christmas Land, but imagine, turn one, Surveil Land, put this into your graveyard, turn two, play your land, and then you just have a rampant growth on turn two. So there's some cool stuff you can do with this um, outside of just playing it for raw rate, even if you don't have a desert. I mean, four mana, six, five trample, not the best, but it still can compete with some things. So uh, be on the lookout for this one. I, I like the card a lot. I think it's got good stats. Next card I have that I wanted to uh, talk about here is Vadmir New Blood. So this is a 2-2 for a black and a colorless legendary vampire rogue. When you commit a crime, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it, Unfortunately, they like to put this line of text on that says this ability only triggers once each turn. Uh, unfortunate, that is kind of the bane of my existence at, the, at this point. When I've gone through every single card in the set, that is the line of text that I least want to see. But anyways, I, I think this is still decent. And then as long as it has four or more counters on it, it has Menace and Lifelink. Once you get it to a 6-6, six, six, it's a 6-6 six, six Menace Lifelink, which... Pretty good. Here's the thing, the spot where I really like this card. The Specifically in the Prof's Eidetic Memory deck in Standard, which is one that I recently won an RCQ with. Seems like a lot of people like that deck. And what's, what's really nice about it is Prof's puts plus one, plus one counters on things. That deck already has a decent number of ways to commit a crime. You might want to play main deck Hearse if you're choosing to play this card. Now, there's going to be another two-drop later on the list that we'll talk about for profs. You might have an idea of it already. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you can build the deck in such a way to kind of ma maximize the amount of crimes that you're committing, I could see this potentially being good. And it's just a decent way to fill the curve that just gets, you know, scales out of control later in the game. Once you get up to a 6-6 six, six Menace lifelink, that's really hard for your opponent to race. So I like this card. You know, we'll have to see exactly how it plays out, though. Next up here, we have a cool, the Unrepentant. This is a 5-5 Flying Trample for BBRR, and then it has the ability where you can sacrifice three other creatures to put a creature from your hand onto the battlefield. Activate at sorcery speed and only once each turn. Now, this is kind of the most obvious pairing with this is maybe something big like Atraxa or Titan of Industry, which is cool. But also remember that there was a recent reprint from the set here in the form of Terror of the Peaks. Now, what's kind of cool with this about Terror of the Peaks is if you draw two terrors, right? Now, again, maybe Magical Christmas Land, but you can go turn four a cool if you have some, some tokens in play. And then turn five, you can go cast terror, sack three creatures, cast a second terror, and that gets you just two terrors immediately on turn five. Um, so that could be something cool where there's like, you're creating a bunch of token creatures, like maybe Greedy Freebooter and ways to generate mercenary tokens, something along those lines. But yeah, I mean, 
if you can fuel this, even even if you can't activate the ability the turn you play it, it's still a 5-5 flying trample for 4 is nothing to scoff at. It's totally, totally reasonable stats. Yeah, be on the lookout for this one. I think it's got some interesting applications and uh, good with, uh, you know, just like I said, just putting a bunch of tokens into play, which maybe not that hard to do these days. The next card that I want to talk about here is the classic, absolute classic Doomwake Harden Scale Spade. Every single set. I look at the spoiler, and there's always at least two or three cards that just get, they just get my gears turning, and I, I, I you know, I'm going to tell you, hardened scales would be good this guys, this time, guys, I promise, and uh, this is perhaps one of those cards, which is two, Ornery Tumblewag, which is two and a green for a 2-2, two, two. at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can put a counter on target creature, and then it has Saddle 2, which is uh, a new ability, which basically is like crew for creatures kind of thing. And then when it attacks while saddled, you double the number of counters on target creature. What's kind of interesting to me is that, you know, I've played a ton of hardened scales specifically in the Pioneer format. It's obviously have, it has its pedigree in Modern. People know about scales in Modern. The hardened scales deck in Pioneer, it's hard, really hard to explain this, but it, it kind of already has the amount of stats that it needs. Like, this is just stats. It's just numbers, right? And it, all of the hardened scales cards in Pioneer are like that, where you have, you have plenty of ways to double up counters, Conclave Mentor, hardened scales, Ozolith. You have, you know, Luminarch Aspect this card siege veteran you have one drops that put counters two drops that put counters you're 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 all good all the way up the curve the one thing we're missing which we're probably never going to get but a, a man can dream is walking ballista because that is what turns the deck from just numbers into an actual payoff as opposed to just here's some stuff and maybe you can block it maybe you can't um and this is kind of more of the same so we'll have to see if, if scales can be good but uh, I, I don't know if I have the, I don't know if I have hope for scales, but we'll see this time around. Next up, we have Gisa or Gisa, the Hellraiser. I'm pretty sure it's Gisa. Uh, five mana, three BB, four, four for a uh, legendary human warlock. It has ward of two colorless and two life. So in order for them to target this, they have to pay both of those costs. It says skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one and have menace. And whenever you commit a crime, you make two tap two, two zombies. This ability only triggers once each turn. I know, I know. But this thing is pretty cool where, um, you know, the turn that you play it, they have to pay a relatively steep cost to be able to kill it. Like if in standard, for example, this is where I'm looking at this card, you know, the normal, the general removal spell costs two mana go for the throat things like that so in order for them to kill this they have to spend four mana and two life and if you can say have the way to commit the crime in play that doesn't cost you mana to activate which something like an unlicensed hearse could be you can immediately trigger this which is kind of sick right five mana for a four four that just makes two two twos when it comes into play if you have the hearse of course or if you pair this on six mana with like play this and a duress or this and a cut down um there's some ways to do that so uh, i i i've never been the biggest fan of aklazots in the standard demir golgari whatever decks and i think this one might uh, kind of replace aklazots as the the five drop of choice Staying in the theme of black cards, we have Forsaken Miner, which is a 2-2 for a black that can't block, and it says whenever you commit a crime, you may pay a black. If you do, return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. So there's some really cool ways to kind of utilize this. One that a lot of people initially came up with was Priest of Forgotten Gods. Now, one, one thing to worth noting here, be careful with this in Priest of the Forgotten Gods. But the issue with Priest of the Forgotten Gods with Forsaken Miner is the targeting is part of paying the cost. So you're paying the cost, targeting them. The most important part is here, the Forsaken Miner triggers happen before you get the mana. So you can't actually use the Priest mana to get back the Miner. Now, with all of that said, it still works very well with Priest. You just have to have additional mana untapped, where... You sacrifice the miner, uh, you can pay, you know, whatever. If you have a swamp untapped, you pay the black, get the miner back, and then you still get the priest, you still get to resolve the priest activation. So I think this card has potential applications with that. There's some other stuff too, where it's good with Mayhem Devil because you're targeting your opponent with a Mayhem Devil trigger. So if you can sacrifice Forsaken Miner to something, target them with Devil, pay a black, get the miner back. There's some cool stuff you can do with that. So 
uh, good in like those sacrifice you know style strategies. So I only have one card on the screen for this one, but this uh, does include the five reprinted fast lands: Blooming Marsh, Inspiring Vantage, Spire Bluff Canal, Concealed Courtyard, it's Botanical Sanctum. That's the one. So the enemy fast lands are being reprinted. For those of you who don't know, um, just wanted to touch on this quickly. They're massive, right? Standard has kind of been in a position where if you wanted to play a kind of more aggressively slanted enemy color deck, say Boros Convoke or uh, perhaps like is it pirates we've tried on the channel before people have tried people have tried various simic cookies strategies that you know um, have a lot of power in them but the man is not the best so it is very nice to be to kind of complete the cycle of the uh, the enemy fast lands and i'm sure that these are going to be a massive massive player in standard next card i want to talk about here is doc or lock Grizzled Genius, blue and green for a 2-3 that says spells you cast from egg your graveyard or exile cost two less to cast, and plotting cards from your hand cost two less. So I'm not as interested about plotting cards from your hand costing two less. That's cool. Maybe something there. But what I'm very interested in this is just a card. It's kind of like a storm enabler, where if you can pair this with ways that cast cards from your graveyard, Underworld Breach, Past in Flames, things of that nature. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that deck looks like. That sounds like a project for the one and only Aspiring Spike. Uh, maybe I'm sure he'll he'll probably work on that. But keep an eye on this one. If there is any sort of storm deck that has you know, Breach or Past in Flames, which sometimes some of those already exist, uh, this could potentially be a good enabler for that or as a, you know, just a way to generate a bunch of mana. Newt, Archmage's Newt, next card here, one and a blue for a 2-2. Two, two. It's got a lot of text on it. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback, flashback cost is equal to its mana value. Uh, mana cost, rather, excuse me. That card gains flashback zero until end of turn if it was saddled, and the saddle cost is three. My problem with this card, and I want, I really want to love this card. I really, really do. My biggest issue with this card is the saddle cost. So the three is kind of where I could see this maybe fitting in is some sort of blue-red prowess adjacent deck with like Monastery Swift Spear and things like that. And then um, I guess it's not even that good in prowess because you're casting the spell after combat and typically you want to cast spells pre-combat with prowess. So, I mean, this card reads like it has potential, but I, it's, it's going to be really hard for it to find a home. What I would recommend if you're trying to build around this card kind of maybe just ignore the saddle cost. I think this is paired best with just cheap cards, cantrips, removal spells. Like imagine a situation where you play this, they don't kill it. You untap, removal spell, kill their creature, cast a cantrip, attack, flashback my cantrip. You don't have to be saddling for this card to be good, but the body is kind of tough and there's no evasion. So I want to like this one, but this one might need a, a little bit more help later on. Next card we have here is Rakdos Joins Up. So this is another kind of reanimation style effect. This is a five mana legendary enchantment. It ETBs return a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield with two additional counters on it. And whenever a legendary creature you control dies, it deals damage equal to that creature's power to target opponent. There have been various five mana reanimations, reanimation spells. Cruelty of Gix um, is kind of the, the main one. Um, I guess the really the only one, honestly. Well, Cruelty of Gix is by far the most played one. What I like about Rakdos Joins Up is not only does it make your Atraxa a little bit bigger, those two counters can and probably will matter. What's nice about this is against the mid-range matchups, if they kill your Atraxa, they just take nine. <laughs> so, you know, your your Atraxa is replacing itself tenfold with drawing four or five cards, and then if they go for the throat it, they probably just die. Now, it's not as good against the Exile removal, Sunfall, Ossification, things of that nature, but I could see this being very strong in the right matchup, and like I said, the two counters definitely could matter, so if there's any sort of, like, discard reanimation Atraxa style of thing, I could definitely see this card uh, making an impact, especially against the black decks. Bonnie Paul Clear Cutter is where we are going next. This is a 6-mana six 6-5 six reach, 3 green, blue, blue. Uh, when it ETBs, you make a bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. And whenever you attack, not with itself or just it's just whenever you attack, period, draw a card, then you may put a land from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. Now, I'm not going to disagree with you. This card is very expensive, right? Six mana. Uh, you need to be getting a lot for your six mana card. 
but I think you get a pretty decent amount off of Bonnie Paul. You get to you get a six five reach. You get likely a six six token. So you have two two six power creatures. And then even if if you have anything else in play that turn, even the Bonnie Paul is not attacking that turn, but it doesn't have to. If you have anything else in play that turn previously that you played before the Bonnie Paul, you just get the draw a card. And on top of all of that, if you're playing with sort of like self mill where you're milling over cards or you're playing with the Capenna sack lanes, you can get those back field of ruin, anything like that. Uh, you can get lands from your graveyard specifically. So uh, this is a lot of stats, you know, 12, basically 12 power for six mana that draws a card, the turn that you play it. That's a lot. And it's something to consider if there's any sort of like green, blue, big mana strategy, which I don't know if that exists right now, but maybe it will. All right, next up, we have Bristly Bill Spine Sower. This is the other Hardened Scales bait card that I alluded to earlier. This is uh, two, two for two. It says Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature, not just itself, and then you can pay five to double the number of counters on each creature you control. I, I like the look of this card. Landfall counter on any creature is a pretty powerful effect. The problem is we don't have fetch lands in Pioneer. You know, you're not trying to put Evolving Wilds and Fabled Passage into your Hardened Scales deck that is full of one and two mana cards. That's just not, that's not something that you can realistically do. So that's kind of an issue. But I don't know, even if you just go Hardened Scales into this thing and you get one trigger to put two counters off of your land without spending mana... That sounds like it could be potentially good enough, and heaven forbid if you get to untap with this thing a second time. So, you know, I, it is legendary, which makes it a little awkward, but if you can maybe find a, if you can find a hybrid of the scales deck where it's the scales deck that wants to play a bunch of land of war elves, maybe you can ramp into the five mana ability of Bristly Bill. So, you know, that is something to keep in mind as well with stuff like Stone Coil Serpent, doubling the counters on that could be massive, so... This card's got a lot of a lot of a lot of things going for it. I think it has a little bit of potential. Gerolf the Flesh Rite is what we have next here, and uh, it's two and a blue for a two three. Whenever you cast a spell during your turn, other than your first spell that turn, you make a two two blue and black zombie cre uh, zombie rogue creature token. Excuse me. And whenever a zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a counter on it for each other zombie that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. What's really cool about this is it's a very Monastery Mentor adjacent card. And what I like about Geralf a lot, it kind of seems that it scales a little bit better than Mentor. So for those of you who don't know, there is a blue-white deck in Standard right now that plays Monastery Mentor, Haughty Jin, and then it also plays Helping Hand and Recommission to rebuy those cards from the graveyard. Now imagine if you, say, mill or discard a Geralf the Flesh Rite, put it into your graveyard, Helping Hand it for one mana, and then you have, say, maybe it's turn three or something, right? Helping hand it for one mana. You play a one mana cantrip. That is the, a spell that you've cast during your turn other than your first spell. You get a 2-2. Two, two. And then if you play another cantrip that turn, you get another 2-2, two, two, and you get a counter on the other zombie. Now, maybe that is just, again, we've, we said a lot this this uh, this video, Magical Christmas Land. But I think this has the potential to be very, very good in that deck and maybe even replace Hottie Jin. So be on the lookout for this one. I'm sure I'm going to be uh, I'm sure I'm going to be casting this one a lot. Now, I know that I said I didn't have these in any specific order, but I did save my two favorite cards for last. And uh, if you've been watching the stream and maybe a couple, you know, videos over the past couple of weeks, you may have already have an idea of what my two favorite cards are. So the first one we're going to take a look at is Duelist of the Mind. For those of you who don't know, this is, as you can see on your screen, Nathan Stoyer's World Championship winning card. So this is a blue and a colorless for a star three flying and vigilance. I actually just learned the other day that it had vigilance. I... I <laughs> I was under the impression it didn't, and I still thought this card was nuts, and now I think it's even more nuts. Uh, its power is equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn, and whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do discard, this ability only triggers once each turn. So as we talked about earlier, I've been playing a lot of the Prof's Eidetic Memory uh, deck in Standard, the Demir Prof's deck, and this card seems like it fits just, it was tailor-made for a deck like that, where that deck already wants to draw a bunch of cards to help trigger Prof's. This card also wants you to draw a bunch of cards. It is 
it's basically just like a second profs, right? Now it doesn't stack as well because you don't get the counters, but if you know if you're drawing two cards a turn or something, then this is still gonna still gonna be a pretty sizable body. And what's also apparently now that I know it has vigilance, what's really nice about this is specifically the reason why Steam Core Scholar is so good in the profs deck is the curve of turn two profs, turn three scholar. Uh, put counters on it, and then you just have a four-four flying vigilance. So you get to off, you get to play offense and defense at the same time. And this card also does that. On top of all of that, it says this ability only triggers once each turn, not once on each of your turns. So if you can somehow commit a crime on your turn and your opponent's turn, you can keep looting with this, and then kind of keep churning through your deck. And I know you're not going to trigger profs on your opponent's turn. But yeah, there's just a lot to love about this card. And uh, yeah, Flying Vigilance, it just, it seems like it was tailor-made specifically for the Profs deck. So uh, I'm going to be playing a lot of this card in both Standard and Pioneer, and I'm very excited to do so. And I'm also going to be playing a lot with the last card on our list. And uh, if you've gone through the entire video, you probably have an idea of what it is, because you're going to ask yourself, why is this card missing? Well, here it is. Slick Shot Show Off. This is my pick for best card in the set. I think a lot of people's picks for best card in the set. Um, it is two mana, red and a colorless, for a 1-2 flying haste. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Slick Shot Show Off, say that five times fast, gets plus two, plus zero oh, until end of turn, and you can plot it for red and a colorless. A lot of people, when they first saw this card, they didn't really kind of understand why it had plot. You know, because it, it's a weird card, right? It's one of those things where if you're just playing a mono red deck, you can cast this on turn two, and it's totally it's totally fine, right? Two mana, one, two, flying haste. If you get to untap with it, cool. If not, cool. You're fine with that. But where this card really shines is the fact that it has plot. You get to do so many cool things with this. If you plot it on turn two, the, the, the biggest application I see for this card is in prowess decks. Like, I'm thinking blue-red prowess in Pioneer and maybe even Standard. And uh, both those decks probably also want profs. Good thing to profs. Or good, this is a good body to profs on because it has evasion. And then the other place I like this card a lot in is the heroic deck in Pioneer because that deck has protection spells. And what's really cool about Slick Shot is you can plot it on turn two and then turn three, you play it, have all three of your mana untapped. You can maybe, say, cast a cantrip, some kind of pump spell, Defiant Strike, Ancestral Anger, things of that nature, maybe even multiples of those. This card scales better than Prowess because it's plus two instead of plus one. And on top of all of that, because you didn't have to spend mana on it the turn that you're playing it, you still get to hold up that God's Willing or Lauren's Escape to be able to protect the Slick Shot show off on their turn or if they have a removal spell on your turn. So just a lot to love about this card. There's so many cool ways that, like, cool things that you can do with it. It's also a wizard, so it turns on Wizard's Lightning and Pioneer. Maybe something there. Now that you have Soul Scar Mage, this, and Gitu Lava Runner, you know, it also plays well with a bunch of cheap red cards, which the red deck wants to be playing anyways. You see where this is going. So yeah, a lot to do with Slick Shot show off, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to be showing off the power level of that card once we have access to the set. So that is the Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoiler review top 15, but not really top 15. Um, anyways, if you have made it to the end of the video, thank you, first and foremost, please be sure to let me know what you thought of the video in the comment section down below. What is your favorite card in the set? I want to hear from you guys. Let me know what you were excited to play and build with. And without, uh, with all of that said, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.